corn. There we go. All right. So I'll just introduce myself. You can also interrupt me at any point where you have a question. Um, but so just introduce myself. I'm Krista. <laughs> I'm actually a respiratory therapist by trade. I'm employed by Praxair, which is now merged with Lindy. And Praxair Lindy is the distributor. Um, we're hired by Parker Porter, the manufacturer, to do the distribution and education for all of their hospital side of their equipment. They can, you know, they do their own dental side, but they've recruited us for the hospital side. And so um, this is a Parker Porter unit. It is called the Nitronox, and it provides a set 50% nitrous oxide, 50% oxygen mix. There is no titrating that. There's no changing it. Uh, there's no knobs. There's no buttons. Uh, so it's a super easy piece of equipment to use. You're simply plugging in your two gas sources. You're going to plug in a vacuum source, uh, which is called the scavenger. And then you're, uh, you have to attach your demand valve, which we'll talk about. You attach your circuit and you hand it to the patient. So it's an extremely easy piece of equipment to use. Um, that being said, my education is pretty thorough. I go through kind of exactly how the system functions. I go through uh, how to set it up. I go through through basically anything that could potentially happen. So um, it does last about an hour long, just to warn you. And um, our objectives, the first thing we're gonna do is go through the setup. We'll talk about the items that you need for the setting up of the device, how it's about a five-step process for setting the device up, and then how to double check the pressure gauges before you hand the mask to the patient. We're going to then skip ahead and we'll talk about post-use, post-use cleanup, what kind of happens on the device um, when you are done and you close up shop. And then uh, we'll talk about cylinder maintenance. That is kind of the most complicated part about using this device is the cylinder maintenance, just because, you know, we're not used to the hospital setting anymore. We always have the grab and goes or the carry boats. It's with built-in regulators, so it's um, kind of hard uh, with this device, there's no, in the hospital setting, there's no device that has this type of connection. And so uh, that is the most hard, you know, complicated part about using the cylinders. And then uh, lastly, we'll talk about nitrous oxide, the gas itself. So items that you do need for setting up the device, you'll need your nitronox, you'll need the demand valve, the disposable patient circuit and the disposable mask. And then potentially, depending if your masks come underinflated, you'll need a 30 to 60 cc syringe to properly inflate the mask so that you get a good, nice seal. So, um, so to go into that, this is your Nitronox unit. It, uh, the top part there, that box is the blender. It's gonna blend the nitrous oxide and the oxygen together in that 50-50 mixture. You go down, you do have two cylinder slots on this cart for nitrous oxide and two cylinder slots for oxygen. For you guys, you're gonna utilize wall source oxygen. And so those cylinder slots are just gonna be empty and you'll actually have a 10 foot hose that goes directly from the wall uh, where you quick connect into your wall outlet where you're typically have a flow meter attached. You would pop out the flow meter. You would pop in that wall oxygen connection and then that hose will lead directly to the back of the unit. So for the nitrous though, when you're gathering this equipment from your storage, you're gonna wanna make sure that you do have two nitrous oxide cylinders on there. One of those should be tagged in use. It's gonna be the one that you open each and every time you utilize the device. You always wanna be opening up the same cylinder and using that cylinder all the way down essentially to nothing. Then the other one will become your backup full cylinder. And that full cylinder, um, it, you know, ideally you have that tag full, you do not tap into that full cylinder until your other cylinder runs out of a gas, okay? And so the tags are gonna kind of be important. And then I do usually recommend having an empty tag. So if you have the perforated pull tabs, those will say, you know, full or in use or, and then they'll say empty. Um, if you don't, if you have your own tags, you know, having an empty tag is a nice thing to have too, just because it's real easy to forget what's, you know, what's happening there. If one runs out, uh, you're able to use that empty tag and tag it right away. So you don't forget. But um, so once you're sure you have an in use cylinder and you have a backup full cylinder, you can go ahead and head to the room. I do want to point out something quick on the 
uh, on this slide essentially before I go forward. Can you guys see my arrow by chance? Yes, I can. Okay. So this right here, this long white cylindrical tube, that tube is the scavenger. Scavenger is what's gonna do the work to get rid of your patient's exhale gas. Scavenger is a completely separate device that's powered by wall source vacuum. And so you're essentially gonna utilize these two devices, the head unit, the, uh, or essentially the blender, and the scavenging device, you're gonna use those two separate devices together to create a one directional flow in your circuitry, um, which we'll explain kind of when we get to the circuit. So this is the demand valve. The demand valve is mounted to the right side of your device. And this piece right here uh, does come in and out of the bracket. And you guys keep this actually in the Pixis, okay? And so you're basically, um, the way that this demand valve works is this part right here, the stem at the bottom, actually quick connects into the hose. And when you're gathering your equipment, I always recommend getting your device first, wheeling it as close to that Pixis or med room door as you possibly can, so that as soon as you get this out of the Pixis, you lock it in that hose right away right, before you even put it in the bracket, because once it's in the hose, it's not gonna fall out on the floor. Um, this is a rather expensive piece. I wanna say it costs, it's either high 500 or $600 now in the mid 600s. Um, so it's not a cheap piece. You don't wanna be dropping it on the floor. So I always recommend locking it in place as soon as you take it out of that Pixis, rather than stick it in your pocket or, you know, set it on a pile of stuff that you're going to carry to the room because then you risk dropping it. Now, the way that the demand valve works is this entire system, the Nitronox system, that blender, is a demand flow system, meaning it's going to take a breath demand in order to release gas out to the patient. And so anytime the patient um, does not have a tight mask seal or is not in, you know, basically inspiring or breathing in, nothing is coming out of this device. They have to create a tight mask seal and they have to have an inspiratory pressure to open up the valve and release gas. So inside this valve here, you have this little exhalation valve and it's inside this outlet adapter. Um, this is a very important piece. This is the valve that's gonna open and close with each patient breath. Okay. And so when your patient creates that tight seal, they breathe in, their inspiratory pressure is going to pull that little yellow, yellow valve open. That'll create the pressure on the demand valve and the demand valve releases the gas out to the patient. When the patient goes to exhale, you're going to be coaching them that every breath in from the mask gets returned back out into the mask, okay? And so you're gonna have them exhale. When they go to exhale, there's no inspiratory pull on that little exhalation valve. So the exhalation valve will close, okay? So that little interior valve is gonna open and close with each patient breath. That's what's gonna release gas out to the patient, okay? All right, that again is mounted to the side um, and we'll kind of go through how to connect that. Um, so disposable patient circuit, let's talk about how this works. So now we have our unit, we've gathered it from our storage area, we've gotten the demand valve out of the Pixis and we've connected it to the hose, okay? Then we're gonna grab our disposable patient circuit in mask. Your disposable patient circuit, this pink and blue cor uh, corrugated tubing comes all coiled up like this. It comes one size, so you're just grabbing one package of pink and blue. Masks come in multiple sizes. They're color coded as well as number coded. The masks is a universal fitting. So any general anesthesia mask is gonna work on this device, any AMBO mask. You do not have to purchase ours. If you have a different supplier that is cheaper, you can absolutely get a different supplier for the mask. The circuit, however, is a proprietary circuit. It's the only one safety tested um, for the FDA clearance of the device. It's the only one safety tested on our device. So that one, you have to purchase through us. The masks, you do not. Okay, as far as safety wise. Um, now the circuit uh, is a dual limb circuit or a coaxial circuit, just meaning it has the tube inside the tube. And essentially the way that it works is we've got our T piece portion here, okay? The T where the pink and the blue intersect, 
That's what connects to the outlet adapter on our demand valve again, which is mounted to the right side of the device, which we'll see in a couple of slides. But essentially the way it works is then the fresh gas mixture, when the patient triggers a breath, fresh gas mixture is leaving that head unit, leaving the demand valve and entering into the uh, T and right away it narrows into the inner blue tube. The inner blue tube is considered the inspiratory limb of this dual limb circuit. Okay, so it'll go out to the patient through the center of blue tube. Then when the patient goes to exhale, this pink corrugated tubing is actually connected to our device called the scavenger. The scavenger is connected to wall source vacuum. So that vacuum will actually have a suction pull that's gonna pull our exhale gas through the outer limb of the circuit, outside the blue, but inside the clear, all the way back to the T, it cannot enter back into our fresh gas supply. It has nowhere to go, but down into the pink corrugated tubing, into our scavenger and out through the wall source vacuum. So this has been particularly important to understand with COVID um, and worry about contaminating the demand valve or contaminating the, the actual blender. Um, all flow in this system is one directional goes out to the patient through the inspiratory limb and it goes directly, that exhale gas goes directly back to the scavenger through the expiratory limb. Uh, there's no backwards flow in this allowed. So there's no way for that exhale gas to get back into that demand valve or back into the head unit. So it's a simple wipe down in the outside of the equipment when you're done utilizing it, right? So that expiratory gas is gonna flow down. Once it gets to the pink corrugated tubing or into the scavenger, it's gonna get vacuumed out to protect, just in case you're having scavenger issues um, or you know you forget to turn on the scavenger, what's gonna happen is, is that there's a green one-way valve just above that pink corrugated tubing. So in that T, right above where the pink corrugated tubing happens, there's a little green one-way valve. That prevents any backflow from the scavenging um, device uh, from going backwards into the circuit. So again, all flow in this is gonna be one directional, um, no ability for it to go backwards. All right, so it's a five-step process for setting up this device. Now we have all the pieces, right? We're gonna go ahead and set it up. The first thing I wanna point out on this five-step process is you can see here our gas sources are before our vacuum source, okay? And our demand valves right away, right? We wanna lock that in place as soon as we get it out of the Pixis. But I point out the gases are before the vacuum source simply because that vacuum source is going to make a hissing suction sound, okay? So as soon as you plug into that wall source vacuum, that scavenging device is gonna to start to hiss. It's gonna sound like full suction as if you were having the suction canister on the wall and you put it on full suction. Okay, uh, you want to do your gas sources first, because when you open up your nitrous oxide cylinder, you want to listen and make sure there's no hissing or leaking of gas. Okay, if you hear any kind of hissing or leaking of gas, you would immediately close it. And we'll talk about troubleshooting that when we talk about cylinder maintenance. But ultimately, um, if I plug my vacuum source in first, I might miss a hissing leaking nitrous cylinder. Or, or even a hissing oxygen, right? Um, we don't wanna waste oxygen from the wall, so we would wanna make sure that's not hissing as well, okay? So, but first step then, first thing we're going to do is attach our demand valve, okay? The first thing we wanna do is attach it to the hose. And the reason we wanna attach it to the hose first is because like I said, then it's not gonna fall on the floor. Once it's quick connect into that hose that leads out there, it's not going anywhere. Then the next thing we're doing, the second thing we're doing is we're opening up our bracket and we're pushing the demand valve from the back to the front of the device uh, into that bracket, okay? We gotta push pretty hard, pretty firm till it's all the way in and flush with the front uh, on, that, on, that, um, on the front of the outlet adapter. Otherwise that will not, um, that little door on the back the retaining bracket will not close, okay? So you've got to have that closed. Then you have to align the little back of the demand valve um, into the metal slot so that you're able to close the door completely and then tighten the black screw handle down, okay? So that's step one is connecting this. First thing you do, pop it into the hose, then pop it into the bracket, 
and then screw the bracket on, okay? All right, second step. Once you've got that done, you're able to move to opening up your nitrous oxide cylinder. So to open up your nitrous oxide cylinder, you're going to look at those cylinders. You're going to find the one that says tagged in use, right? Um, and ultimately, you're going to take your black wrench, place it on your cylinder, and you dial that wrench one full 360 revolution around of the wrench, lefty-loosey or counterclockwise. When I'm standing over top of the device and I'm opening up that cylinder, I always think of it like a hand on a clock, right? I'm going to go counterclockwise, one full 360 revolution around of that wrench. Century City, it's a little tough to get it all the way around because it kind of hits the back of the metal of the actual cabinet. It also kind of can get wrapped around that little gauge on the top. So you just kind of got to you know, play, replace your wrench a couple of times if you're bumping into things, but you ultimately want that dial or that hand or that wrench rather to go all the way around one full 360 revolution around 12 o'clock to 12 o'clock, six o'clock to six o'clock, however you want to do it. Okay. Once that is open, one full revolution around, you should see 750 PSI on your tank pressure gauge. Okay, that one that's on the top of the platform. If you do not see 750 PSI, if it's lower than that, or it's not reading anything when you open up your cylinder, your cylinder is empty, okay? Um, so know that uh, it should read 750 PSI. If it reads anything less than that, that cylinder should be exchanged. Um, that cylinder is empty. Okay. Uh, the reason it's always going to say 750 PSI when you open up your cylinder and not a lower pressure is that nitrous oxide, when it gets compressed into these cylinders, it becomes a liquid. And so the gas turns to liquid form. The liquid form messes up that cylinder pressure gauge read. And so that's why the cylinder pressure gauge is always going to say 750 is because that actual gas or the liquid makes it an inaccurate amount, okay? It'll always say 750 until all of the gas is actually used up from that cylinder. Once the cylinder liquid is gone, the gas is gone, it'll then start to register the gas vapor that's left in the cylinder. And so from that point, you've got maybe three to five minutes of use. Customers say it's way faster than that. Um, and so with each breath, you'd watch that gauge go down. So if it's less than that three or than that 750, you automatically know you literally have less than three to five minutes of use. So that's why you would change it right away. So it should say 750 PSI on the uh, tank pressure gauge. And that's why your tagging is so important on your cylinders, right? Because you're not going to have a lot of warning when your in-use cylinder runs out or any warning when it runs out, right? And so that way you want that backup full cylinder to truly be a full cylinder and you want to be able to tap into it uh, should you run out so that your patient doesn't have a, a whole ton of interrupted um, pain management. All right. Third step is just connecting your oxygen hose. Again, you might have to pop out a flow meter to pop in. Um, yours might be a twist quick connect. It might be this uh, same quick connect. And there's lots of different quick connects out there, but you're essentially just clicking right into that spot. And then step four is going ahead and connecting your vacuum source. So again, um, this is your long white cylindrical tube. Obviously, this one's mounted to a wall. Yours is, is on the pole. Uh, you can see our pink corrugated tubing, right? Come into the top of the black port. And then coming out of the bottom of the black outlet here is our gray hose. The other end of the gray hose is going to have your vacuum quick connect, okay? And so you're going to take that vacuum quick connect and you're going to plug into your white outlet on the wall, unless you guys have the purple ones. Um, when you do that, immediately you should hear that hissing suction sound. If you do not, you want to make sure your quick connect is all the way in. Make sure that your gray tubing isn't kinked that it's connected on both sides, both connected to the device as well as the quick connect, right? And that there's no bends in it. And then lastly, you wanna confirm that this black ball valve on the front of your scavenger is pointing in the six o'clock position, 
not the nine o'clock position. So you want to think of it like a stop clock. You want it pointing in the direction you want the flow to go, which is out that gray hose. If it gets turned to the nine o'clock position, the suction is blocked and you would definitely hear the difference. And so while it's a lot more pleasing to the ears to have the suction off, if you've taught your patient correctly that every breath in from the mask gets returned back out into the mask, but you don't have this scavenger running and pulling away that exhale gas through that circuit, it'll only be a couple of breaths before your patient takes it away and they'll say, can't really breathe very good into this. And that's just simply because you don't have your scavenger going. You don't have that removal of that hexyl gas from the expiratory limb of the circuit, okay? So anytime the mask is up to the patient's face, you should hear that hissing suction sound. If you do not, you've got to figure out why and make that adjustment, okay? So always in the six o'clock position, not the nine o'clock position. All right, and then lastly, you're just connecting your disposable patient circuit. So you'll see that our T piece here where our pink and our blue intersect, they slide right over top of your outlet adapter on your demand valve. So this is a good picture here of your demand valve mounted into the bracket that you mounted into. Right here's our little black screw that tightens down. Essentially, that slides right over top of the outlet adapter of our demand valve. Then our pink corrugated tubing slides over top of the black, not down into the white. That's probably the only mistake I do see people make when they connect the circuit is they want to stick this pink corrugated tubing down into the top of the white. And actually, if you look down into the top of the white, you should see a black mesh filter. That filter is called a foam flow resistor. And that foam flow resistor actually should be replaced every six months. It just tweezers out and a new one tweezers in. And ultimately, the way that this scavenger works is it's called an open air interface scavenger. And what that means is not only is it going to pull the exhale gas into the black inlet here, but it's also going to be pulling in room air through that filter. That room air is going to further dilute out that exhaled nitrous so that by the time it goes into your wall, quick connecting out through your wall piping, it's diluted out by this room air. Okay. And so <clears throat> ultimately, um, just make sure you always keep the top of that open so it can pull in room air and you're always connecting to the top of the black not down into the white. I have seen everything from pink stickers, the word pink, pink ribbons on this black. I've even seen not here written in Sharpie on top of the white, okay? Um, just to help people remember, you're attaching to the top of the black, okay? And then lastly, you'll attach your elbow to your patient mask. The mask, if you have our masks, they come with prongs. Um, those prongs are for strapping it on the patient's face. We do not ever recommend strapping it on the patient's face, nor does it come with straps. And so for that, once you get your size, because they're color coded based on size, just pull those prongs off and throw them away. It's gonna make it a lot easier for your patient to hold their mask in place if those prongs are gone. The other thing about the mask is that that port at the top, this is where you're gonna inject air if you do not have um, a squishy air mask, right? If your mask, come super underinflated, which um, I forget where you guys are. Um, if you're in Colorado or anywhere high altitude, you probably don't have to inflate your masks. Um, but any low altitude, you will have to have a syringe um, and inject some air into that top port. Your rule of thumb or my rule of thumb as a respiratory therapist is I, I'm okay with touching the hard plastic with one finger, right? Um, but if I can grip the hard plastic with two, three, four fingers on the sides, right? Then I know it's underinflated. Uh, I wanna be able to have a nice squishy mask that fits in the bridge of the nose, nook of the chin. And then when it's on, on the face, you don't want any leaking. You don't want um, any kind of, you know, if the patient smiles or um, talks, you don't want the corners of their mouth to be leaking, right? Because remember, in order to trigger a breath demand, from this demand valve system, you have to have a tight seal and you have to close that loop so that when you breathe in, it pulls that gas into that ex or excuse me, inspiratory limb, right? If you've got any kind of leaks, you're not going to be able to draw enough breath, okay? 
The other thing I want to point out about the circuit is there are two little caps. One is under the thumb, actually on the elbow end. The other one is on a stem, also under the thumb, um, on the T-piece. Those little caps are for Lorlock style end title monitoring. I do not have any labor and deliveries that actually are end title monitoring. Um, if you do, you know, go for it, but um, most do not. Uh, and so for you guys, if you're not end title monitoring through those caps, you're gonna wanna make sure that those caps are on and that they're closed nice and tight because if they fell off or um, they're open, can affect sedation just because it breaks that closed loop system. And then it also uh, would potentially leak exhale gas out into the room, okay? So you always want to make sure those caps are on and closed nice and tight when you're attaching your circuit. All right, so now your, your device is completely set up. You just have to double check the pressure gauges before you hand it to the patient. So the front of the device has three pressure gauges. The bottom two pressure gauges are line pressure gauges. Those pressure gauges are measuring the pressure in the hoses that are coming into the unit. So for your oxygen, since you guys use wall source oxygen, more than likely your oxygen is always gonna be perfectly in that green zone, 50 to 55 PSI, okay? And that's because that comes out at most facilities out of the ports at 50 to 55 PSI, okay? So what we're really looking for is, is our nitrous oxide low, okay? If it's low, then we have to wonder where is the pressure going? Um, is it leaking out into the room? And so these two need to roughly match each other. If they both are relatively upright in or near that green, so the green zone again is 50 to 55 PSI, 45 to 60 is in okay range, okay? Um, and so you can essentially, I hope that doesn't mean we're gonna <laughs> stop, Essentially what that means is you're good to go as long as they're both relatively upright and match each other. If they ever do not, you wanna make sure that they're within 15 PSI. You don't wanna see this gauge at like the 11 o'clock, 10 o'clock, nine o'clock position because that um, will mean potentially a leak. It might just need a regulator adjustment, um, but you, know, you would wanna pull it from use and figure that out before you let the patient use it. So if they, but if they look like this picture and they match each other, you're good, you're golden, you can hand it to the patient, okay? Uh, <clears throat> Next, you have your mixture pressure gauge. The mixture pressure gauge is not going to tell you a lot. Essentially, what it's gonna tell you is if this ever goes into the red zone, as much as 40 PSI, it's gonna give an audible whistling sound. Okay, the whistle, uh, user manual calls it a whistle alarm. Um, remember, there's no battery or electronic parts to this, okay? And so ultimately, um, it's gonna be more like a high pressure tea kettle type squeal, and it would likely come and go with each patient breath. Um, if this ever happens to you, you are gonna wanna pull it from use. That being said, watch a couple of breaths, note what the needle on the gauge is doing, because there's two options. One is that needle is in the green zone, bouncing up into the red zone, but returning to the green zone, that is a simple mixture pressure adjustment that your biomed can do, okay? It's right in the user manual. If, however, this is incrementally climbed and it's whistling and it's just getting higher and higher into that red, that is a mixture pressure issue that this device would have to get shipped into Reporter and I would help facilitate you shipping that into Porter. So I would be who biomed would contact um, should that be what's happening, okay? So that's the mixture pressure gauge. That's it for the device as far as um, how it set it up, what you could potentially look for on your devices. Let's talk about post-use cleanup. Post-use cleanup, if you look at this list, I'm not gonna forget to do any of these things with the exception of potentially closing up my in-use cylinder. So I'm gonna do that first. Go straight, you, you open it first, you're gonna go straight to closing it first, okay? And so you're gonna close that cylinder righty-tighty or clockwise close till you meet resistance. Then the rest of this you can do in whatever order, right? You're gonna disconnect and discard the breathing circuit, disconnect from your, your uh, two wall sources, your oxygen and your vacuum, Wipe down the equipment with any hospital approved wipe. I do usually recommend keeping a box of alcohol prep squares in the basket, um, just because uh, that pretty shiny clear face plate on the device does not stay pretty and shiny and clear very long with the cavi wipes. They're just so harsh 
on those clear plastics. So you can take a little alcohol prep square on those. Everything else though, including the demand valve just gets wiped down. With the demand valve, I recommend you pop it out of the bracket, right? Open up the bracket, pop it out of the bracket with it still attached to the hose, wipe down the outside of it with it still attached to the hose. And then once you get your device back to the Pixis, that's when you go ahead and take that demand valve off and put it directly back into the Pixis. So keep it attached while you're wiping it down and while you're rolling um, back to your storage area just so it doesn't drop. And then lastly, of course, you would uh, go ahead and store it where you go. Now, when you close your cylinder, it is important to know, and this is probably the most common troubleshooting call that I get, is I've closed my cylinder, but I can't get my gauge to go to zero. Okay, so for the oxygen side, as soon as you unplug from the wall, it's just going to drop straight down to zero. That's okay. What's in the hose bleeds into the room, and we don't care because we breathe oxygen, right? With nitrous side, there's only a certain parts per million when they create this equipment that's allowed to just leak out into the room over the course of time. And so the line pressure gauge, as well as the cylinder pressure gauge, is going to hold pressure. The longer it holds pressure, the more airtight your equipment is. You would actually call me if you <laughs> close that cylinder and it immediately drops to zero, you would wanna call me because there's some kind of leak if it's going directly down to zero, okay? So know that that's a good thing. Know that that's okay. It's okay to have that in there. You do not have to bleed it. Um, it's meant to have that in there, okay? All right, quick, let's talk about cylinder maintenance. So we get all done with our procedure, right? We're our, with our uh, patient, okay? And we close our cylinders and in the middle of, you know, the cylinder running out, essentially, you had to swap to your backup full cylinder. By the way, when that happens, when you run out of nitrous, you're just immediately cracking open your nitrous oxide cylinder. And so more than likely, your patient's gonna be your indication that you're out of nitrous oxide, right? They're going to let you know because what's going to happen is, is the cylinder pressure gauge is going to go to zero. Your nitrous line pressure gauge is going to go to zero. The patient will continue to breathe in. They won't realize the nitrous is out um, because the system will continue to give them 100% oxygen. Okay, It will switch from 50% oxygen to 100% oxygen. So they will not feel a difference with how much breath that they can draw in. It's just all going to be oxygen. And oxygen is the reversal agent for nitrous oxide. So very quickly, 100% oxygen is going to flush them of any benefit that they had from the nitrous oxide. And your third and final uh, visual cue is going to be them, right? They're going to let you know this is not managing my pain anymore. You'll come in, you'll find those gauges at zero, and you'll know you need to open up that backup full cylinder. So when you open up that cylinder, immediately gas is going to start flowing because they're both connected to that integrated regulator right underneath the platform. Okay, they're all both connected instantly. When that happens, when you have to swap over, that's when I tear your tag to empty or I at least bare minimum slap the empty tag on the one that just went empty. Okay, because that's going to remind you at the end of your of, of your patient using it to go ahead and change that cylinder. So to change the cylinder, right? Here's our integrated regulator. Just so you know, there's one per uh, per type of gas. Okay, it, and you can't connect nitrous over here as extra because it's pin indexed specifically for nitrous oxide, right? And when you run out. The first thing you're, or excuse me, the once you're changing the cylinder, what you're going to do is you're gonna wrench it closed, righty tighty, right? Make sure it is for sure closed before you twist the T-handle, just in case there is any pressure left in there. More than likely there's not, but if there is, you're gonna get a little pss, and that's okay. Um, but you don't wanna have it open because if that little pss might be pss and keep going, right? So essentially have your, wrench close your cylinder before you open up your T-handle. So you'll open up your T-handle by twisting this T-handle. Okay, I'm gonna back up a slide. This T-handle right here, okay? Let's pretend we're opening up this cylinder. We're gonna twist this T-handle once we get our cylinder wrench closed, twist it until the point of the screw that you can see right over top of it, you'll be able to see the point of the screw down into this. You want to twist until the point of that screw goes into this bar. If you keep twisting, it's going to fall on the floor, okay? 
And so uh, it's going to be very important. Just go as far as the bar. Once you've gone as far as the bar, it'll allow you to push that bar towards the cylinder. And then it always swivels open to the left. Okay, and so that little bar right here is going to swivel open to the left. You're going to put your new cylinder on, which I'm going to talk about in the next slide. Once you get your new cylinder on, you're going to close this bar, pull it towards you, and tighten the T-handle. If you watch our training video, our training video, or like our form of training video, tells you that that bar is going to move into place. Problem is, is as the system ages, the swivel bar gets sticky. Okay, it loses its lubrication. And then what happens is, is the swivel bar makes this corner get stuck up. It won't pull towards you unless you manually pull it. So when you tighten your T-handle down in that instance, that'll make that bar go at an angle. And instead of having this bolt right here flush and this bolt right here flush with the bar, this bolt on the swivel side will stick out and this bar won't be straight. It'll be at an angle like this, kind of a diagonal. If it does that, that's gonna leak nitrous, okay? You have to have that bar pulled towards you and you have to have the T-handle tightened down in order to change the cylinder. Or, I mean, to fully make sure you're reconnected once you have your new cylinder on there. So inside, when you take your cylinder off, there's going to be this little rubber yoke washer. They're metal on the outside, rubber on the inside, these are the only kind of washers you can utilize with this device, okay? If you utilize the plastic ones, those will leak nitrous. Even if you get that T-handle good and tight, they are still leaking a little bit of nitrous into the room, okay? And so always make sure that this rubber is intact. There's no rips or tears in the rubber.